Hunter again from Nitin Sports Podcast. For the podcast, it's it's easier. But but th- thank you for joining me. Since uh, since you're on here, we can get started if you started if you want. Sure. Yeah. Uh, thank you for joining me. Um, you, you do a great job on the NFL Network uh, as always, and uh, I, I always watch the NFL Network. And just thank you for joining me for the on the podcast. And first of all, uh, how how are you and your family doing in this tough situation? I appreciate that. We're we're safe and well. Um, We've tried to follow all the guidelines. So it's kind of funny. I, I went out yesterday. The, we've gotten a lot of rain recently. And um, the sun's been out the last two days. So I was getting some yard work done and whatnot. And I realized I hadn't started my car in almost a month. Oh, wow. So I jumped in it just to see if the battery was still good. And uh, it started. But that that's... <laughs> Please. Hopefully they, this thing gets resolved sooner than later. Um, but now, uh, I have, uh, now the NFL draft is next week. Um, on uh, it's, it's going to be interesting with the virtual draft. Uh, I don't know. It's going to be. It's this is the first time we're going to see this happen. But what are your thoughts on this uh, virtual draft coming up next week? I think it's smart. I think it was really the only way that the NFL could could hold its draft. Um, in terms of being safe and responsible. So uh, I think what it is, it's funny when you talk to people, everyone says the the MVPs during this draft are going to be the IT people. And I tend to agree with them on that. Um, there are just so many unknowns because it's never been done before. Um, so how smoothly will it run? What if you lose an internet connection? Um, how do all those sorts of, of potential scenarios play into it? And um so I'm interested to see how it works. I feel I feel bad for the players, you know, many of whom this is it has been a dream for them to to walk across that stage, you know, to hear their name called, walk across the stage, take the picture. Yeah. The commissioner. Um, so I feel bad for them, but safety first. Yeah. So before before we go any further, for, for my viewers who just joined, this is the great Jim Charter from NFL Network. He does a great uh, job, uh, awesome job at Lewis. Don't use great. We don't use uh, great. <laughs> but uh, yeah, he does a great, uh, awesome work on the uh, NFL Network. And um, first of all, before uh, before we go any further, I just want to uh, can you explain when, how, uh, when did you get interested in the sports business, sports media, and uh, with the NFL? And how do you when did you get interested in the, with the NFL? Sure. Um, well, I always had an interest in journalism. The problem was back in high school, I felt I couldn't write about it or participate because I was playing on the team. So it would be very difficult for me to write something critical about a teammate um, or a coach. So I never got involved with sports journalism until I got to college. Um, At that point, I had some offers to go play small college football, but I knew I was never going to play in the NFL. And so I decided to focus on, on, you know, a career path. And that's when I started writing about all different sports. Um, you know, when I graduated from Howard, went to a small paper in Muskegon, Michigan, then went to a, a mid-sized paper in Tacoma, Washington, and from there went on to the San Diego Union Tribune all within about three years. And ultimately, to, to give you the condensed version, in, in 95 or 96, I was covering the NBA at mm-hmm. large for us and was presented with the opportunity to cover the NFL, to cover the San Diego Chargers. And initially I said no, um, because I was really enjoying um, covering the NBA from from um, afar. Right. You know, we did a lot of things with the Lakers and Clippers. And, you know, some smarter people at the paper talked to me about it and told me what a good opportunity it would be. And so in 95 or 96, I spent a year as a backup and then moved on to the Charger beat, stayed there for eight years and then started covering the, the NFL at large. And for me personally, it's the best professional beat you can have and have a family um, because you, you're you home most of the week and typically would only travel on the weekend as opposed to, say, NBA or baseball or hockey where, you know, you can be gone long stretches at a, at a time on any day of the week. So, um, so it's been the best fit for me from a family perspective as well as a professional perspective. Hmm. Interesting. Um, yeah, so now uh, to the NFL free agency and draft. Man, what a crazy NFL free agency this was this year. I mean, still it's still going on, uh, obviously. But um, what are your, but don't we say that every year? 
Yeah. <laughs> say that every year, you know? Yeah. So, yeah. You know, but uh, what are your thoughts? Um, especially, man, Tom Brady, that was a, a, a like outside of the box. I, I knew that. I mean, I didn't know that he was going to leave, but I knew that at some point he will go to a different team. But I didn't expect Tampa Bay to step up that much. But I, I, I expected the Chargers to, to be in there. Um, and uh, probably the uh, oh, I, uh, mainly the Chargers because everybody was linking him to LA. And what are your thoughts though with the Tom Brady situation? What, what, what do you think? But what do you think Tampa will, will do this season? You know, I was one of those guys who I think was was thinking with my heart more than my head during a lot of that process, where I really wanted to see him stay in New England, finish out with one team. Um, but having known and having seen it before where you see great players change teams, even great quarterbacks, when you talk about, for me, being a San Francisco native and seeing Joe Montana leave the 49ers, you always know it's a possibility. And then you see Brett Favre, you know, change, leave the Packers and and um, spend time with a couple of other clubs, including a division rival. So you always knew in terms of, of um, uh, the possibility that Tom would change teams. But I kept in my heart saying hopefully at the last minute it would work out and he would stay in New England. Right. Having said that, um, I always felt that the two best fits for him were the Chargers and the Bucks. And as it's been explained to me, the two things that weighed most in his decision was one, wanting to stay on the East Coast where, you know, he has a son in New York and it was important for him to 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 be close to him. Um, his family spends a lot of time in Florida. South Florida in particular, um, as well as South America, where they vacation. So that that was a factor. And also being able to work with Bruce Arians, who was working mm -hmm. with a lot of legendary quarterbacks. But, you know, maybe selfishly speaking, I kept saying, I think the Chargers are the best fit from a personnel standpoint. Obviously, they're loaded offensively at the skill positions. And then you can, um, they were seeking to upgrade their offensive line. And with the sixth pick, could have even gone offensive line there if they so chose. Um so, you know, and defensively, they're loaded as well if everyone is healthy. But look, Tampa Bay's um, an extremely talented club as well. And that division, it's, it's going to be a dogfight when you look at him. Talk about the Saints as good as they are. Um, you know, we know Carolina is in the rebuild mode at this moment. And Atlanta um, is still trying to get back to where it was and still has some talented players. So. Uh, I think it's going to be fun, I, and I can't wait to see Tom and Bruce Arians. So one thing I know about this, Tom, you have to push him hard as a coach. Um, he's not somebody who he's going to challenge you each day. You, you've got to present him with something new, and Arians will do that. And the other thing I know about Bruce is Bruce pushes his quarterbacks. He's not an easy guy, and he's not afraid that if you have um, the label of being a GOAT, as when he got to Arizona with Larry Fitzgerald, um, he put Larry through a few things to where you have to earn Bruce Arians respect um, and to yep. be a, a, a B.A. guy, as they say. And hmm. I think from that standpoint, it's going to be fun to watch this this marriage between Tom and Bruce. Yeah, that's, that's interesting. Yeah. Um, but uh, I'm a uh, I'm a Dallas Cowboy fan. So uh, I'm what sorry. do you yeah. <laughs> yeah, I'm yeah, I'm yeah, it's OK. It's OK. It's OK. <laughs> no, but it seems like. In the, but what are, your th uh, what are your thoughts on the Cowboys all season? And are you concerned with uh, obviously we signed a couple players like uh, Aha, Clayton Dix, Don Terry Poe, Alden Smith, who hasn't played in five years, uh, and then we re signed Cooper? Do you think, uh, are you still concerned that? I mean, obviously we still haven't signed Dak Prescott yet, but um, what are your thoughts on the Cowboys all season? You know, at this point, I'm not sure that the Cowboys are better than they were a year ago. Um, mm -hmm. We still have to see how they're going to take to the coaching of Mike McCarthy and that staff. Um, losing Travis Frederick, I think, is a big thing on that offensive line. Um, getting Amari back was was obviously important for them, but but he did not play well, you know, during stretches last year. Yeah. Um, I'm I'm not. I, I need to see what else they do, and I'm not one of these guys who's a hot take guy who's going to say. You know, this is who they are at this point, and, and this is what you can expect. I think you always have to wait and see what the entire roster looks like going into a camp before you can make judgments or, or start mm -hmm. to make real evaluations about a team. But just on paper to this point, I would say I don't think they're as strong a team right now as they were a year ago. Hmm. 
So, so, uh, so as a so as a Cowboy fan, I'm, I've been asking this this question to everyone. But do you think Mike 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 McCarthy was a safe hire for us? Safe. Um, he's an experienced coach and he's a good yeah. coach. So yeah, I, I think I don't think you necessarily could have gone wrong there. Look, everybody knows my feelings on on the whole coaching situation right now in the NFL, and I think. I think it's just a shame that, you know, there's such a lack of diversity among head coaches and the, and the young coaches, particularly young minority coaches, are not getting the same opportunities yeah. that, that others are getting. And y you only know what you have um, once you give someone an opportunity to show what they have. And I'm not saying that Jerry Jones was wrong to hire Mike McCarthy. I'm just speaking in general about the league. Um, there's just some things on going on right now that are really disheartening both for me as a fan of the NFL and for young minority coaches who are interested in, in climbing that professional ladder and who aren't getting that opportunity. And the one guy we can talk about more than anyone right now is Eric Bieniemy. Yeah. You know, when you look at the history, recent history, people who have been offensive coordinators for Andy Reid have gone on to become head coaches, even though they didn't call plays. And that's Doug Peterson in Philadelphia and Matt Nagy, who's now in Chicago. Well, Eric same boat offensive coordinator had an mvp a quarterback league mvp a quarterback two years ago and this past season had the super bowl mvp and yet there's eight openings and and he doesn't get a job and yet people with resumes that are not as as good as his do get jobs to me that's right. a problem yeah i agree with you yeah i agree 100 percent because eric gravity uh i watched him from afar he he knows his stuff he's a good offensive coordinator and uh, I think either the Giants should have taken a chance on him or uh, from last year or the – my Cowboys even should have uh, considered him as a, for an interview. But I guess they, they only – I guess were, they were zeroed on uh, Mike McCarthy. But let's see what happens there. But, uh, but to, the, to the draft now, I mean, obviously there's a couple of free agents out there uh, with Cam Newton and Winston. But wh why um, – what's up, Nate? Nate just joined. <laughs> um, Big uh, Nate. Yeah. Uh -oh. <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah. So, uh, what? What do you? Th before we get to draft questions, but what are your thoughts on why is uh, Cam Newton, Clowney, and Winston still on the market? Well, I think they're all different situations. I think with Cam, one is is health. You know, I think teams want to get their hands on him to see just how healthy he is. Um, clubs that I've talked to talk more about his shoulder than his foot. The foot injury he had last year. So I think teams want to evaluate him. Me personally, I, I, and, I, and I've written this, so I'm not speaking out of turn, um, I think a smart team does take a chance on Cam. I think when you have a guy who was playing at a really high level before he got hurt uh, two seasons ago um, and now has had almost, will have had almost two full years to rehab and recover, um, who's motivated, who potentially you're getting on a discount contract, if you were willing to fit your system to his skill set, I think you can get a real steal and Cam Newton. So I'm, I'm intrigued to see where he goes. With Jameis, the whole thing is kind of fascinating to me. I've said this before that I think that in some ways he's a young Ryan Fitzpatrick. He's going to give you the wild plays, but he's also going to make critical mistakes that hurt your club. And I, I've seen where some have tried to compare his, his career arc to that of Peyton Manning in terms of touchdowns, interceptions, that sort of thing. But here's where it separates for me. If you go look at Jameis last year, in the fourth quarter of games in which it was a one-score game, he ranks almost near the bottom in most major categories. Yeah. For me, that is a problem. That's when, when real quarterback play shows up in those tight games at the end where you've got to go win it for your club, and he didn't make those plays. So, um, so that's an issue for me with him. Uh, who was the third one you mentioned? I'm sorry. Oh, oh uh, Clowney? Uh, because oh, I feel like he's – yeah. He's, he, he put a price tag on, on, you know, where he values himself. And other clubs haven't been able, willing to meet that at this point. I think he's going to have to come down on his asking price. Yeah. Interesting. Because I feel like the Dallas Cowboys, we can use another pass rusher. You can't have enough pass rushers. So I feel like Clowney could fit with Dallas. But, I mean, if he uh, – I think if it's 17 – I think he's asked for 20 million, if I'm correct. But if he, if he brings it down to, like, 16, 17 million, then uh, teams will start – uh, like going after him, right? If it's seventeen million, it de it depends. Here's the danger when you when you play this out. If you let teams get to the draft and they're able to address that need, if they need an edge rusher, then the market starts to shrink even more for you. 
yeah. particularly from a financial standpoint. So it's a it's a it's a it's a it's a dangerous game. Um, and and right now he's, in my opinion, I think the longer he waits, the less money that's out there because these clubs that do need edge rushers, if they get them in the draft, um, are not going to be willing to pony up the type of money that he wants. Hmm. So uh, now speaking of the draft, uh, obviously I feel like this is one of the deepest drafts I- I've ever seen with prospects, and especially the wide receiver, uh, the, wide receiver the wide receiver class is deep. Um, we're, so where do you, uh, obviously the, my Cowboys have the 17th pick. They can go anywhere. Um, but the receivers, though, uh, like Henry Ruggs, Jerry Judy, uh, Justin Jefferson, where do you see them landing uh, possibly like in the first round, late first round, early first round? Um, look, I, I'm being completely honest on the draft. I think you have people who study the draft year round and yeah. know it well. I'm always a little um, reticent to start talking about what I believe about players I haven't seen play. You might pick up a game here or there, but I haven't studied them. And mm-hmm. so it would be wrong for me to say that I think so-and-so is better or a better fit here or there. Um, judging off what all the quote-unquote experts are saying, um, obviously it's a very deep draft in wide receivers. Um, there could be, you know, close to a dozen, it sounds like, gone in the first couple of rounds or, or first four rounds, um, definitely. So everything you're hearing um, is that you have teams like uh, San Francisco, Dallas, uh, the Raiders, others who who might be interested in, in wide receivers. And so um, I'm going to be interested to see where they go. I don't know which one is better. I don't know right. believe that, that speed um, and 40 times always translate to being great football players. We all know Jerry Rice didn't run a great 40, but I don't remember many people catching him from behind on a football yeah. field. Mm-hmm. So, um, so I can't really speak specifically to the draft and who fits um, where and necessarily who the best players are. I simply rely on on the people who do this for a living when I interview them mm. and report on what they think. Mm. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Um, so, for, so I have a. Uh, so, how is it like uh, for, like going to your career? How is it like working with uh, Steve Wise and Mike Silver and the rest of the NFL Network crew? How how is that like working with all of them? Oh, you're mentioning some some tremendous colleagues, man. I mean, they're they're tremendous at what they do. Um, they know this game, they know this league. They have great uh, sources, great rolodexes. So it's um it's fun. I, I learn from them, and hopefully, at times, they learn a little bit from me. But they're extremely talented. And the one good thing about my career is that I've been blessed to work with um, really talented people at every stop that I've been at. So mm-hmm. uh, you just you just try and keep learning and growing. Yeah. So, uh, who, uh, who was, who was your role model in the sports business growing up? Oh man. Um, you take different things from different people, but one of the people very early on who I always read was Ralph Wiley, the late Ralph Wiley, who I thought was phenomenal because there was a, he spoke with truth. He spoke truth to power and, and, you know, as a young black male, I didn't see many people who looked like me in the profession, and to have someone like Ralph Wiley, who was a gifted writer and and who spoke passionately, who spoke truthfully about all issues, particularly as they related to race. Um, man, he was, you know, I have some of his other books that, that, that don't relate to sports as well. Just a tremendous role model for someone like me. Then you talk about uh, growing up in the Bay Area. Uh, yeah. I used to, you know, I used to go to Warriors games and there was a... a, a um, a beat writer for the Warriors at that time. His name is Ron Thomas, who now teaches down at Morehouse College. And and he was he was so um, how do I say this without it coming off wrong? Um, there was just a steadiness to what he did and to getting the information out and making it um, very digestible that I really appreciated at a young age. And then you as, as I grow and, um, you know, there was no Internet back then when I was a kid. So it's not like I could just call it writers from around the country. So it was more of where I was living at that time and who you get to read. And when I was in school in D.C., you get to read guys like Wilbon and Kornheiser and those mm-hmm. guys. And then when I got to Southern California, obviously, the man was was in terms of columnists was was Jim Murray, um, who was just phenomenal. So you take a little bit from all these people. And um, you don't try and mimic their style is one thing I would say to young reporters. Yeah. Um, 
but you just try and see how they construct things, what their thought process is and, and find your voice. And the funny thing is even now, you know, 30 plus years in the game and whatnot, at times I feel like I'm, I still have to remind myself to follow your voice, you mm-hmm. should, not someone else's. Yeah. So uh, before I let you go, I got a couple more things. Um, mm-hmm. What's um, so, be, so being from the Bay area was a 40, you're, 40, you're a 49ers fan, right? I was both. I, I, I mean, the first football game I ever went to was uh, a Raiders preseason game against the Patriots. It was a game in which um, Daryl Stingley was actually paralyzed. So oh. that was the first game I ever attended. And then the first regular season game I ever attended was a Monday night game. Uh, it was the 49ers and Packers, I believe. And John Brody was was, was um, quarterbacking the team at that time out of oh, Kansas wow. Park. Yeah, so uh, speaking of the 49ers, uh, what do you, uh, since, I mean, obviously uh, they fell short in the Super Bowl, but do you think they have uh, the team to go back there in the Super Bowl this year, or they need more pieces? Uh, They have talent, no question. Uh, But I always say it's year to year in the NFL, and you can't necessarily predict future success based on past success. So, and teams that, that, think that just because they did something last year, it's going to carry over this year. The teams Mm -hmm. typically get in trouble. So I do think they have some areas they need to address, but there's no question. um, You know, they've got one of, they've got a genius play caller uh, on offense and Kyle Shanahan, who I think is one of the best who's ever done in terms of play calling. Um, And they've got a lot of talent. And I think that if they can upgrade in in a few spots, um, I think they could be right back in the mix. Mm. Yeah, so now um, I got before uh, before I get to the last two things, I got some couple rapid fire rapid fire questions for you. Uh-oh. So, uh oh. So, favorite hip hop artist? <laughs> uh, you know, truthfully, I'm a more old school R and B guy. Oh. I'm a I'm a Frankie Beverly and Maze guy. Um, you know, it's funny this morning when I was out on the walk with my dog, was listening to a little Roy Ayers. Mm. So I'm I'm really an old school guy, but I have eclectic taste. So if you go on my iPod. You're going to find a bit of everything, you know, R and B, hip hop, country, rock, all of it. So oh, nice. But but at the end of the day, um, for me, it's Motown and um, Frankie Beverly, and um, just just the 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 easy stuff. Mm-hmm. Uh, favorite food? Mm, I probably said pizza. <laughs> I had uh, someone I said that yesterday. That. <laughs> yeah, one of my guests said that yesterday too. Uh, uh, favorite sports movie? Oh, jeez. Mm, that's a hard one. Um, I love Remember the Titans. Uh, would you consider Would you consider the Roman Coliseum a sports movie? Because I love Gladiator. Um, I, 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 hmm, I, I don't know. I guess. I'm yeah. Stress the boundaries. How about that? <laughs> it, the I mean, sport. Yeah. I mean, I, I I think I consider that a movie, a sports movie. I, I guess. If we'll, 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 we can make up our own rules here, I said. <laughs> that's that's true. Uh, favorite uh, favorite thing to do outside of sports. Uh, you know, it used to be. It, it depends on where I'm at in my life. For a long stretch, it was golf. Um, lately, it's been more um, jujitsu and and mm-hmm. um, and finding work working out again i'd gotten for a couple of years gotten out of it and now i've gotten back in it and really enjoying it and the relationships with the people there and that sort of thing and um you know getting my body right again so uh right now i would say that but you know i had the golf bug for a long long time mm-hmm. so so i've been asked all my guests I, that has been joining my podcast is th- during this week and the uh, last week or in the week before um, I've been asking them their perspective on Kobe Bryant, the late Kobe Bryant, and get their feet. So, I, because um, I'm a, he was one of my role models growing up because I used to watch him a lot playing with the Lakers. I love basketball too, and I just want to get everyone's take. So, what I want to get your perspective also: what Kobe meant to you, what he meant to the game, and what what he meant to everyone around the world, even non-sports fans too. He meant. To- yeah, he um, actually the the I believe it was the last year I'd have to go back and check the the dates, but I believe the last year I covered the NBA was his rookie season, and so I was around him a little bit as a rookie, and and um, it was funny. We were all as, as media members, we were all saying, "Man, it's crazy that Dell Harris, the coach, isn't playing this kid more," because all we would hear from the players 
is that, you know, he'd be lighting up folks in practice and whatnot. Mm. And I remember I went to him one time and asked him about, I, I don't get why you're not playing and whatnot. And, and I'll never forget, he looked at me kind of smiling. He goes, you and me, we're going to be okay. And, um, <laughs> but, but, uh, but, you know, but I, I, I'm not saying that to say I had any relationship with him. I didn't beyond that. But the one thing I think I remember about Kobe most, obviously we all remember that competitive will and that drive. Um, but what I also remember is, is watching a boy become a man in so many ways. And it would take too long to go into all of that here. Um, his last game, the 60 point game was incredible. But yeah. beyond that, what I remember, what stays with me now as a father is the love that he had for his daughters, that relationship and his willingness and desire to promote women's athletics. I think, um, mm -hmm. at the end, those are the things that, that really stick with me is just that, that love for his children, the, his growth, the growth as a man, um, and and his desire to, to to really support women's athletics. Yeah, and it was just devastating to hear that his daughter was involved too. Gianna, the thirteen year old, is just uh, horrible. Um, and even the other people that were involved in that horrible crash too. I'm not forgetting about them. But um, the last thing here, would you like to say anything to the frontline people and the medical personnel that's helping us right now throughout this tough uh, situation? Oh, the only thing you can say is thank you. Mm -hmm. I mean, you can't say it enough. You just keep repeating it. I mean. Um, these are people that are putting their lives on the line to try and help us. And um, my heart breaks when I, when I hear them talk about not having um, the equipment that they need, um, the safety measures that they need. I just, I just thank them. Just keep saying thank you, thank you, thank you, and God be with them. Well said. Um, but I just want to say thank you for coming on uh, my podcast today. Uh, this was honor, an honor, and uh, keep, doing your, keep doing a great job. Uh, keep up the great work and uh, everyone go follow Jim Trotter on Twitter, Instagram um, and uh, just, just grateful and uh, you guys stay safe um, and enjoy it. Have a great day. I appreciate you having me. Yeah, no problem. Thank you. Yep.